Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. The Administration for Children's Services is the city agency that provides child welfare, juvenile justice, early care, and educational services to New York's most vulnerable children, young people, families, and communities. The commissioner at ACS is David Hansel, and my guest today, and I welcome you. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Great to be here. Now, you've been here for what? About Seven, 15 months. 15 months. And you came, unfortunately, at a time when we had a disaster that was so public and, and so sad. But the agency, I think, has a whole new energy, or it's a public presence now. Are you on a campaign? I think you are. <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate that perception. Um, and in a sense, we are. You know, I, you're right. I came in uh, on the heels of a, a couple of terrible tragedies we had in the city back in 2016. I started in early 2017. And, um, you know, when I came in, I quickly realized a couple of things. One was, of course, when tragedies like the ones we experienced happen, we as an agency have to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to prevent them from happening in the future. And so we've done a lot internally to strengthen our child protective work, strengthen our investigations, make sure that we uh, are following all of our protocols, we're protecting kids. Um, but I also realized that there's so much more that happens at ACS, so much good work that ACS is doing that the public just doesn't know about. And so um, I have been, uh, in, in my 15 months as commissioner, um, really trying to uh, get out and talk to the public, and that's why I appreciate this opportunity so much, um, to make sure people really understand the totality of the responsibilities that ACS has and the work that we're doing and the positive impact that I believe we're having on thousands of families and thousands of kids around New York City. And so you're really doing more preventative work, I mean, at least making it more public. So you've started all kinds of different programs. You actually started a new division. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Our philosophy, um, and this predates me. I, I, mm -hmm. I have certainly uh, redoubled our focus You've on just it. Made it more prominent. Made it more prominent, and, and really expanded it. Um, but our focus for some time now at ACS has been uh, supporting families. Now, our primary responsibility as a child welfare agency is when somebody reports that a child might be abused or might be neglected, our job is to investigate and see whether we think a child is really in danger. And is that the way a child? and our family gets involved in the system? That's, that's how it it's starts. always by reporting. Uh, well, it's not always by reporting. Okay. So increasingly, because we're yeah. moving to um, preventive programs, right. we have now a lot of programs that are voluntary. The families can come to us and right. say, you know what, we can use some help. Can yeah. you help us? And we'll do that. But traditionally, the way it starts yeah. is somebody calls in a report to the state hotline, says, I think a child's in, in danger here. And we, by law, have to investigate every report the state sends to us. Mm -hmm. And that amounts to some 60,000 reports a year. Mm. It's, a, it's a big volume. Mm -hmm. And often we find that, you know, we're actually the situation isn't as serious as it was presented or, or, or things have, have resolved themselves. But sometimes we find a child really is in danger. The big difference now is when we find that, the first thing we try to do is identify what is it that's creating that risk and can we resolve it by providing services to those parents and those caretakers that will help address that risk. So the issue could be, could be health issues that the parent's having or the child's having or mental health issues or there could be domestic violence or substance abuse in the family. And what we try to do and successfully actually now in most cases is identify the right kind of service that will help address those issues with the parents, keep the child safe or the children safe without having to separate the family or remove the kids. And in the vast majority of cases today, we're able to do that. So when you, do, when you have to remove the child, that's when a child goes into foster care? That's correct. That's but, correct. And now foster care has, includes more people. I mean, kinship programs will look for relatives or family or friends. That's right. Foster care to today, mitigate. too, is, is very different yeah. from, what it, from what it used to be. So yeah. uh, we know one of the things that the research has told us is when a child has to go into foster care, if they can be placed in a foster home with a relative, a friend, someone they know, that the trauma of going into foster care, which is something that is, is real and we want to avoid or, or minimize, that that is minimized if, if they go into what's called kinship care. So now increasingly, uh, when we have to uh, put a child in foster care, we try to identify a family member, a friend, who can take responsibility, someone the child knows. And the city then f funds the support of that child? That's correct. That's correct. We and work does with, that money come from the city or is it a mix? It comes from actually all levels of government. Mm -hmm. uh, money, the funding for foster care 
comes largely from the federal government. That's the one area of child welfare that the federal government has historically invested in. So it's primarily federal, but we also get support from the state, and the city itself is, has uh, been very generous. The, the mayor has been very supportive of the work that we do. But the other reality about foster care that many people don't know, but I think it's really significant, um, is that we have fewer children in foster care in New York City today than we have had for more than 25 years. I was shocked when I saw the figure was, what, under 8,000? It's, it's just below 9,000. It's in the 8,000s. 8,000. 25 years ago, a time you remember and I remember, we had more than 50,000 children right. in foster care. Right. Today we have fewer than 9,000. And the main reason I think that's the case is what I was just describing, which is when we identify a child who may be in danger, we can usually Support respond, the keep the family together, provide services to the parents, not have to put a child in foster care. And that's made a huge difference. difference. Now, the other thing with, with your community centers now, we, we're community, what is it called? Enrichment? Family, family, family enrichment, enrichment centers. Enrichment. And one of them is now open in Hunts Point. Yes, actually, we have three open now. Three. Oh, the three are We have are two open. in the Bronx and one in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And this is... Uh, it's this a very is, interesting... This is, this is exciting. This is something that's new. Yeah. Uh, we just started last year. We've had these prevention programs uh, that, as I was just describing, when we identify there's a risk to a child, a child may be unsafe, we provide supportive services. We call them preventive services to the parents. But, you know, I thought last year, well, why should we wait until a child's in danger? Mm. Couldn't we reach out to parents earlier and, and offer them services, voluntary services, and say, you know what, if you're having a challenge, come to us. We'll connect you with the service you need. It won't cost you anything. Um, you, you, they're all available regardless of immigration status. Uh, they're available to anyone in the city regardless of income. And so we have launched uh, a new division at ACS. We're calling it a Division of Child and Family Well-Being. And the focus of that division is to develop what we call primary prevention. That means services that we can uh, offer to families before they have any involvement in the child welfare system, and hopefully never will. And our family enrichment centers in the Bronx and in Brooklyn are a new initiative uh, to provide kind of a, a hub within communities where families can come, uh, they can spend time with each other, and they can access services that they need that they think will help strengthen the family. And, and each center is going to get $450,000 budget over a years? An annual. That's annual. An annual. annual. Yep. Yep. But to do that, you, it's a contract with a, an existing agency. That's right. But the difference is, from what I understand the program, is that it's the parents themselves, the community themselves, that are determining how they're going to do it, who's going to work there almost, and what programs they're going to offer. Is that right? That is exactly right. And we didn't want to, we didn't want to come a, in. Isn't that an innovation? It's a, it's, it's, not, it's a sea change. It's, a, right. <laughs> it's a sea change. We, we didn't want to come into the communities and say, we think we know what you need. Mm -hmm. We went in, and actually it wasn't we, it was the, the providers that mm -hmm. we work with. This is, these are not run by ACS at all. These are run by private organizations in those communities. Um, we asked them to go in, start meeting with parents. We have, for example, what we call parent cafes. Parents can come in, have a cup of coffee, have a donut and have a conversation about what is it your community needs that you can't find right now. And then each of those family enrichment centers has built up its programs based on what they were told and what they heard from the families and the parents in those communities. So that's, that's I it's, think, it's such It's absolutely a, new. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And we're very excited about it. We've just launched them. Uh, we're going to evaluate them. We hope they'll be successful. And if they are, we'll hope we able, we'll be able to replicate them in other parts of New York City. So now, let's go to another part. Okay. But in the foster care, you have the investigators, right, that look into the reported cases. Right. Those are actually in our child that's protective. That's child abuse. That's child protection, we call it. Child protection. So that's where a program where you're on top of and you're That's right. Those totally are our the staff. Time. They are those your are staff. Those are our staff, our right. child protective specialists yeah. now, go out and do those investigations. foster care, is that under you directly to, or it is, is that it contracted is, out? It is our responsibility, but it is contracted out to 27 foster care agencies around the city. Right. And okay. they actually, uh, they work directly with the foster parents, and they have direct case management responsibility for the children who are in foster okay. care. So now we go, let's go to the other part of it, juvenile justice, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, in that area we have, do we still have Pins, persons in need of supervision? We do. Um, that is still a program. If a parent says, I can't take care of my child, my child is acting out, I need, yeah. I need someone else to, to take to responsibility, that is uh, still available. Right. Now, that child doesn't, that, that goes to the, they all go through a court, right? The family they all court. go through family court. They all go court. through the family court. So you work very closely with family court. Very closely with family court. And, and the representatives in family court are your employees, staff? Uh, well, 
Or do you go with legal uh, services differently? Uh, well, our attorneys, our attorneys, ACS attorneys, go into family court around child protective matters. I see. So if on we, behalf of the child. On behalf of the, uh, well, the child, actually on behalf of the city. In fact, technically okay. they represent me as the commissioner. Right. The child gets a lawyer mm -hmm. and the parents get a lawyer. So every party is okay. represented. But if we feel that either a child needs to be removed, we have to get an order from a judge to do that, or if we feel that the parent needs some services, but the parent's resistant to that, and we want the court to tell the parent, you know what, you really do need substance abuse treatment. Um, we sometimes go to the court and ask for what's called court-ordered supervision to provide some kind of directive to the parent. So we're representing, in a sense, the public, what we think is, is necessary to protect the children, but the parents have their own attorney, and the children do as well. Every party's there, but ultimately the judge in family court makes that decision. So, but in juvenile, let me just, not to uh, interrupt, but in, in the juvenile justice, it's a little bit different, actually. We don't uh, go into court directly. The, the city law department mm. uh, handles those matters. Right. Um, back to, again, the foster care. Sure. To put a child in foster care, do you still have to go through family court? Yes, you do. You, yes, you do. You do. Uh, except in cases, there are uh, some instances where if we're doing an investigation and we think a child is at imminent danger, we think it's unsafe to leave a child there even overnight, um, we can do what's called an emergency removal, but even then we have to go back into family court the next day to get the judge to approve. But you still don't represent the child? The child still has its own, his yeah, or her own okay. attorney, yes. Yeah. So now in juvenile justice, you've got PINs, persons in need of supervision, juvenile delinquents? Juvenile delinquents. And juvenile, juvenile offenders. offenders. So let's That's right. the difference. Okay. Um, <laughs> juvenile offenders are people who have been um, uh, basically arrested for an offense, which if they were an adult would be a criminal offense, but because they're juvenile, uh, it's, not a, it's not a crime per se. Um, but it, they too go to family court. And uh, if they are adjudicated to have committed that offense, uh, then the court makes a decision. And what the court may do is place them in uh, a program which is relatively new in New York called Close to Home. Now, up until about six years ago in New York State, if a child in New York City was uh, adjudicated to have committed a serious offense, um, the only option a judge had was to send them to basically a juvenile prison way upstate, hundreds of miles from their home, where it was very hard to stay in touch with their families, where even if they went to school, which they did, when they came back to the city, they often couldn't transfer their credits. They fell behind in school. They lost their community connections. They lost their relationship often with families. And they lost their futures, most likely. And lost, lost their futures, yeah. and they fell way behind their peers. Beginning in 2012, we went through a radical reform in New York State, which was a great partnership between the state and the city, to say, you know what, we shouldn't be doing that. And so we created the program called Close to Home, which does just what the name suggests, which means now, when a juvenile offender is adjudicated and placed, they stay in New York City. They don't go to a prison upstate or here even. They go into small residential facilities, almost like homes around the city, where they go to school and they stay in the New York City school system. So when they go back home, they can transfer their credits back to their home school. They stay in close touch with their families. They don't go back to their school, though. They, they are educated by they're, the board of They're it. actually in the Department of Education in a special school yeah. program, uh, but same curriculum, mm -hmm. so everything is transferable. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can stay in touch with their families. And of course, the focus is rehabilitation, it's not punishment. And this program's been in place now, as I say, since 2012, about five or six years. And what we've seen in that time in New York City uh, is the number of juvenile arrests has dropped dramatically. The number of young people going into our detention system has dropped dramatically. And the number of young people going into this placement program I described has dropped. So this program has been, uh, based on you know, clear evidence, has been very, very successful. Um, and we're on the verge now, as you know, of really going even further uh, through the new Raise the Age legislation and right. saying now, who were the children kids. who got sent to Rikers? Um, up, in, up until, actually still today, um, this close to home program, our juvenile system in New York State only applies to young people who are 15 or younger. So 16 year olds who are arrested are treated just like adults, 17 year olds are treated just like adults. That will change beginning in October. Under the Raise the Age legislation, 16 year olds who are arrested after October 1st will now be treated as juveniles, just the same way 14 and 15 year old, which of course is the right thing to do. We don't right. want 16 year olds right. being sent to adult prisons or, or to Shutter. write prisons. Right. Um, and so we are uh, working very closely with uh, colleagues across the city to be prepared to implement that law beginning in October 1st. And so that really is um, a wonderful extension of the work that we've been doing through the Close to Home program now. So you're recruiting new uh, 
new, um, what would we call them? Ju ju we, we are calling them youth development youth specialists. Development We're very special. excited. This is actually <laughs> just launched. We um, just got the approval to create uh, a new title of city staff, we'll call it a new civil service title, which we're calling Youth Development Specialist. It's a brand new title, never existed in New York City before. Um, it has uh, qualifications um, for, uh, for staff to work with young people. Some of them will be now 16 and 17 year olds, but staff who really have the skills, the experience, the training, and the desire to work with young people mm. to help them get their lives back on track. We're very excited about this. We've actually just started the recruitment mm -hmm. um, and we're looking forward to hiring hundreds of New Yorkers who want to do this work and we look forward to people uh, So in the last to do um, what, 70, 30 years, 35 years, there's been so much more insight into the effect of everything on children's development, right? That's right. So not only do we um, want them to be close to home. We know how important the prison, you know, if they're in a facility, how important the visitors are. That's right. Visits. And also we know the impact of all of this on a child. That's right. So that affects, doesn't it, the programming inside the facility? It absolutely does. We know so much more now about brain development, adolescent brain development. We know so much more about socialization. Uh, and we so really understand much better than I think we used to uh, the kind of skills that young people will need to be successful adults. And so all of our programming uh, both within our detention facilities and also within the close to home program is designed around that information that we have. In that and the enlightenment program. also went to the court system, didn't it? It did. It did. I There's an innovative, more innovative programming. I mean, more in-depth interviews of children who come before the judges and there is and actually it starts even before that because mm -hmm. um, we work you know, with our colleagues in the Department of Probation in the city um, even before the cases get into court um, we do a much more sophisticated risk assessment to decide do the kids even necessarily need to go into detention. Maybe there's a, another program that would be an alternative that would keep them at home, keep them in their community, uh, you know, before they even start that process. So really, you're right, absolutely through the entire system, I think there's a greater understanding of, uh, of youth development, mm -hmm. and that is now structured into everything that we do in the whole juvenile justice system. And where do we, what, do, what are we doing about drugs? <laughs> Uh, that affect not only some of the kids, but the parents, and that has the direct effect and impact on the children. Well, that is a concern. That is a concern. And how does that get addressed? Yeah, it is a concern. It's an um, interagency kind of problem. It is very much an interagency problem. We, we certainly can't solve it alone no. at ACS. We work very closely with uh, our, our colleagues at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, our colleagues at the state level. Uh, the state has a big role to play with regard to both substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right, Ronnie. When we do our investigations, um, very often the thing that's putting a child at risk may be parental substance abuse, and, okay. and we have to address that. And then what happens? Well, ideally what happens is um, we work with the parent to get them into the kind of treatment that they need to um, address their substance use, um, both for their benefit, uh, but from our perspective, primarily to make sure it's not having an adverse impact. So the on threat children. almost hangs over that if they don't do something, they're going to lose the, the the child is going to be put into foster care until well, they do. If if the if we think the risk that's related to substance abuse is serious enough to create a real danger for the children, and we can't get the parents to engage in services, then that's a last resort in some cases that we have to take. And what at what point do parents get charged with abuse? Um, well, then it's not charged exactly. No, I mean, well, there, there may are be, some well, there are criminal, yes, right. there, no, that's true. Yeah, no, there are crimes, of course. That's not you. That's uh, the that courts. would be the NYPD, that's the police, the, the district system. attorneys. But very often in these cases, if there is both an issue of child abuse or neglect and potentially an issue of criminal abuse, we will investigate with the NYPD and they will make the determination about whether to refer the case to the district attorney's office for a prosecution. And it starts sometimes some of the famous cases. Of course, we always know all the famous, infamous cases, right? Mm -hmm. When a tragedy happens, and that's what the problem is that you have to battle all the time, I guess. It is, it is. Yeah. But you know, when you think about, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we, we investigate 60,000 of these reports every year, and you hear about one or two. The vast majority are, first of all, not nearly that serious. Many of them, it turns out, really there's not an issue that needs to be addressed at all. And in the vast majority where there is an issue, we can address it with working with the parents, providing services. It doesn't become anything like the issues that people so often hear about. If I was a caseworker, tell me, who would I be? <laughs> do I have a master's degree in something or do I have a special educational 
tell me. You, I'm applying for sure. a position. You, you could, and we'd love to have you apply. <laughs> we are always looking for good child protective specialists. There isn't an age limit, right? <laughs> there is not. I'd be delighted to, to have you. Um, we have incredibly, uh, uh, just amazingly um, talented child protective specialists. Some have masters. It's not a requirement. Um, most have a bachelor's, and then they have a certain amount of coursework in, in relative, uh, relevant fields. Um, and then once they start at ACS, they go through a very rigorous training process, which takes in total about five months. Uh, they have about spent a couple of months actually in what we call the academy. It's where called the, what is it called? The Satterwhite, Satter Satter the James Satterwhite Academy. Yeah. It's been in existence many years. He was a, a wonderful, yeah. you know, very, very uh, major figure in child welfare mm -hmm. in New York City. Um, they spend about two months in the academy um, getting, you know, in-depth, full-time, nine-to-five training. And then they move into one of our field offices around the city, but they stay in training for several months after that. Um, so they're under supervision of more experienced staff. Uh, they kind of learn the ropes. They gradually build up a caseload um, because we want to make sure that they feel comfortable, they have the skills, they know what to do uh, before they actually are out there in the field handling a full caseload. So we hire people that have the right uh, educational background, skills, and obviously interest. And then we make sure that they all get enough training so that when they're out in the field, they're prepared to so do they what get is a very case, difficult work. They keep the case. Usually. They usually keep, yes, once they're assigned a case. And it's uh, in the community keep. that they're assigned to. Yes, yes. All of, all of the, uh, our work is geographically related. We have uh, you know, offices around New York City, uh, several in every borough, one in Staten Island, and, but several in each of the other boroughs. And each of those uh, field offices handles cases within their community districts that they're assigned to. And usually when a child protective specialist receives a case, they handle that case at least through the investigative process till we decide what we need to do. Then, depending on the outcome, that case may get handed off to a, a prevention provider, a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. uh, it may go a different route, several different routes. And referred to the Family Enrichment Center. <laughs> or to the, well, <laughs> right. no, we don't refer to the, because the Family Enrichment Center is oh. completely separate from child oh, welfare. Oh, all right, okay. So fa yeah. folks can go there yeah. having nothing to do with child welfare. Exactly, I'm sorry, I just shouldn't <laughs> have done that. <laughs> and now they're better equipped, aren't they? They are, they are. Um, and I their have also, case load is reduced? We have brought the case. You added down. more people, didn't you? We've hired uh, this year. We'd hired uh, since I started about 600 people. We're hiring about 400 How more. How many actually, case workers do you have? We have about 1,800 mm. uh, that go out in the field and do this work. It's a very large, uh, very okay. large number of folks, and we have hired more. And one of one of the things I have really focused on in the time I've been there is making sure that we're providing them all the support they need to do the work well. Um, they're tough jobs. They're tough jobs under any circumstances. And um, I want to make sure that we're not making them any tougher than they need to be. So, you know, we've been focusing on, on technology, um, making sure that they have equipment to do the work well, making sure they have transportation. They're out in the field every day, literally going out to people's homes. And they need to be able to get there. And so we're, we're now, for example, we're using zip cars. Oh, good. So if, uh, if a staff member needs to get somewhere you can't get by public transportation, they can use a zip car. We all do it, right? Uh, I don't own a car in New York City. I don't know about you. I use Zipcar all the time, and, and now we're using it to support our work. So we're also looking at innovative ways to make the work more efficient so that our, our staff can focus on uh, what they need to do and make sure they're keeping kids safe and helping to support families. And they feel more appreciated as you had this nice week of appreciation and recognition? I, I certainly hope so. Uh, we had really an unprecedented uh, week of appreciation for child protective specialists in New York City. The mayor issued a proclamation. We had a great press event at City Hall. Um, and the real goal of the, the week of appreciation, really there were two goals for it. One was um, to make sure that the public, the people in New York City understand what our child protective specialist, what our agency really does, not just a little piece that they often hear about. And also, frankly, to give them a chance to say thank you, because from my perspective, our child protective workers are really first responders. When a child is potentially in danger in New York City, we are the first responders that go in, just the way NYPD does when there's potential crime, just the way the fire department does when people are at risk because of fire. We go in when kids may be unsafe. And I think it's important for the public to understand that and, yeah. and appreciate that. And do, we, do you call the employees in the other division, the other programs, are they also child, they're not child no, protective. No. What else do we have there? We have, uh, well, we have staff that oversee the foster care program, mm -hmm. even though uh, the direct mm -hmm. responsibilities in the agencies, but of course we're ultimately responsible. Mm -hmm. We have, similarly, we have staff that oversee all of our preventive services. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, in juvenile justice in both, uh, in the detention centers, those are staffed by us directly, mm. uh, and the close to home providers are nonprofits, but we oversee them. 
Um, and then we haven't talked about our early care and education. You oh, mentioned right. at the beginning, oh, but goodness, we provide important we provide child care to 100,000 children yeah. in New York City every year. Of ages what? That. Um, from birth uh, up through you know programs like after school programs. Mm -hmm. So you know all the way through. And you do the inspections. Uh, the Department they're of Health. They're li li licensed by the Department of Health. They are. They do the licensing, but we hold the contracts and we make sure that they're meeting the programmatic standards. Right. So, but you're not actually. Are you designating the place? They have to apply. They have to apply. They're, we go through after, everything in New York City goes through a procurement process, as, right. as happens in the government. The city still have some centers. Uh, city does not run them directly. They're all now run by yeah. uh, by private childcare. It was providers. an interesting thing when they had their own centers and the populations changed, so they had wonderful build infrastructure, but they didn't have people coming to use them when well, they needed them someplace else. And that's one of the reasons the flexibility. why that's one of the reasons why we think it's better to use private providers because right. they can be more responsive to changing right. needs and and, and you find a good record with child. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, no, the programs are good. And, and of course, there too, we're also on the cusp of something exciting, which is uh, our new 3K for All initiative in New York City, where uh, we've already begun to provide universal, free, three-year-old early care across New York City. We're now doing it in a number of community districts. By 2021, the mayor's committed. We'll do it across the city, as we currently do for four-year-olds. And as part of that, um, the Early Learn program, the centers, the child care centers that right now ACS administers, we're going to transfer those next year to the Department of Education mm -hmm. so that they can develop a true birth through uh, whole, uh, whole, right. whole continuum right. of education. So services. if your enthusiasm is indicative of your, <laughs> your performance, we're very lucky and I think that your performance has been wonderful. We're very mm -hmm. lucky to Thank have you. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll come back again and we'll talk more about more new programs that are being I hatched. would be delighted. Okay? I appreciate Thanks. the opportunity, Ryan. Thank Thanks you so, so much. Thanks so much, Commissioner. Thank you.